CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. So it is 7.39 p.m. on Tuesday, October 8th, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. First, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Oh, I see you waving. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. Adel Blank. Here. Good to have you all with us. Uh, from the Tau, we have Colleen Ralston, our zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you with us. Um, and we are also joined by Steve <clears throat> Moore, free committee. With that, um, I suppose I still need to read all the paraphernalia here. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with the supplemental budget bill signed by Governor Healy on March 29, 2023, which extended temporary provisions pertaining to the open meeting law to March 31, 2025. This extension of those provisions allows the public bodies to hold meetings remotely, provided live, adequate, alternative means of public access to the deliberations. This meeting is being recorded and will be broadcast by ACMI. Members of the public who are participating via Zoom and who wish to offer public comment should be aware that they will be asked to provide their full name and address so that a complete public record of the meeting can be taken in accordance with state law. All participants of this meeting are advised that people may be listening to the meeting without offering public comment, and those people are not required to identify themselves. Any votes that are taken this evening will be conducted by roll call. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, and as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. With that, on our beautiful agenda this evening, um, we have a bunch of administrative items, but we have no hearings this evening. Uh, administrative items relate to the final votes on applications before the board and the operation of the board and as such will generally be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. So with that, we move to item two on our docket. Um, on our agenda, which is docket number 3813928 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, this was heard at our September 24th hearing. It was a um, specifically a an appeal of the decision of the building inspector to issue a permit. Um, at that meeting, the board was not in not disposed to approve of that. Um, and so we had asked uh, that a decision be drafted, which I I put together, circulated around, uh, final version put out this afternoon. Um, are there any additional comments in regards to that draft written decision for 928 Mass Ave? Seeing none, uh, I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington hereby approve and adopt the written decision in Docket 3813. 928 Massachusetts Avenue, which denies an appeal of the decision of the building inspector in issuing a building permit to the owner of 928 Massachusetts Avenue, said appeal filed under section 3.1 in the zoning bylaw. Second to all that. Thank you. So <laughs> vote of the board uh, responding yes or no. Um, Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Holly. Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. And the chair votes yes. That is passed. Uh, moves us to item three, uh, which is the decision in docket 3814, 200 Broadway. Um, this was a hearing that was heard at uh, both meetings in September. Um, a, a decision prepared by Mr. Hanlon and distributed to the board and final version posted late this afternoon. Are there any additional Comments in regards to the written decision for 200 Broadway? Seeing none, um, I will note that uh, we had asked um, Ms. Hoffman if she would go ahead and mull in on the second hearing for that. Uh, so that was a, the full three minutes that it took uh, for <laughs> us to hear it the second time. 
but uh, she has been fully mulled in, so she is eligible to vote with us today. So I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington hereby approve and adopt the written decision in docket 3814, 200 Broadway, which denies a special permit under section 6.1.10.A in the zoning bylaw. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So roll call vote of the board responding yes or no. Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Riccardelli. Yes. Ms. Hoffman. Yes. The chair votes yes. That is approved. That moves us to item number four, which is the um, docket 3817, 15 Janet Road. Uh, this is a case that came before the board um, at our September 24th hearing. Uh, it was a request for a variance. Um, at the end of the hearing, uh, the board was in favor of proceeding. Had asked Mr. Hanlon to prepare its decision, uh, decision distributed to the board for questions and comments and final version posted back out this afternoon. Are there any additional comments in regards to the written decision for 15 Janet Road? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, um, in what I sent to you late today, there are two typos on the front page uh, in the heading, Massachusetts, it's misspelled. It's got an extra S sneaked in there somewhere. And in the summary, the word at the end of the second to the last line should be it instead of in. And those things uh, I should be correct and can be corrected administratively, but I wanted to draw the board's attention to them. Thank you very much. Um, so we will accept those both as administrative uh, corrections. And with that, I would move that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington hereby approve and adopt the written decision in docket 381715 at Janet Road um, with the administrative corrections, which grants a special permit under sections 3.3 .3 and 5.3.9D in the zoning bylaw and grants a variance under Mass General Law Chapter 48, Section 10. Second, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanley. So again, a roll call vote of the board responding yes or no. Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Hanley. Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. And the chair votes yes. That is approved. All right. So this brings us up to um, item five, which is proposed re revisions to the online uh, application for special permit. Um, I know uh, Pat and I have been going back and forth on um, possible revisions to the rules and regulations. Pat, I don't know if we're in a position to discuss those at this stage or they still need more massaging. I think they may need some more massaging. Maybe not much, I don't know, but I haven't had a chance. They've been on the back burner for me now for the last three or four weeks. And so I don't okay. really remember wh what state they're in. All right, let me go ahead and open up. Um... So Mr. Chairman, while we do this, I wanted to, raise one question that we may want to mull that it was suggested to me by your opening comments. Uh, normally our administrative matters are matters that uh, we don't usually have occasion to deal with uh, public comments on. <clears throat> but on the subject that we're about to engage on, mm -hmm. it seems to me that once we get to the point where we've worked through the details and the kinds of things that we'll do tonight, that before taking final action, or maybe shortly after taking final action, it might be good to schedule it as this as an administrative matter and invite the people who appear before us, especially people who are repeat people or yeah. people who've done recently, um, to give them an opportunity to say how they think it works, to say what they think that the how, what, whether they think that the changes that we proposed would help them, whether there are whole things that we're overlooking because we don't see it from their point of view. Um, you know, I don't know what we'll get and I don't know how useful it would be, but it does seem to me to be useful to reach out and give people an opportunity to weigh, weigh in on these things rather than to uh, bitch and moan at their spouses over dinner at how impossible it all is. <laughs> well, one thing I had... So professionally, I just had to file I'm in the process of filing a variance application for Cambridge, who also uses OpenGov, and they've they use it a little bit differently. So I'm kind of 
you know, I've, I've put together a bunch of materials and now I'm like, wait a second, there's actually a different way to think about this. Um, but I will just start with um, basically what I have here. So what I had started with, um, so when you go online onto the OpenGov site and you select that you want to file for a special permit, um, there's not a lot of verbiage there. So I propose that we add some more explanations um, to sort of explain a little bit like what a special permit is. Uh, uh -oh. That's conditional Mr. permit. Chair, breaking up. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me I do. Let's see if I can make this. Let's see if that is that any better. Yes. Okay. Just turned off my video there. Um, so it's explaining a little bit what a special permit is when they're required. Um, encouraging people to consult with inspectional services for guidance. Um, and then just capitalizing special permits. See what qualifies as special permit under state law. You can refer to chapter 48, section nine, uh, which we have a link. The link, I think on our website right now, actually links to section 10 rather than section nine. Um, so we just need to fix that. Um, and then assist you in completing the online application. We have the checklist that we put together um, to help organize the data and documents you need to successfully complete the application. So this would be the, the landing page people would get. It would encourage them to explain a little bit more about what a special permit is, where the, where it comes from, and then offering them the checklist to help them prepare for, uh, for filling out the application. Um, so this, I, I think something like this would just would be helpful in general. It does um, to assist us or, or more to assist people who are, who are going in. Um, I would ask Colleen, cause she's got so much more experience with people trying to navigate this. Um, Colleen, do you get a, any sort of feedback from people who are trying to use the site as to what problems they're having or does that not get back to you? I, I get a lot, um, but a lot of people send me emails and I kind of give them a step-by-step -step of what they'll need, what they have to fill in. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I send them a sample one that they can look at the application and the documents so they can see how they have to fill them in. Okay. It kind of depends. Some don't even know how to look for a special permit to fill out that application. So all different levels. Okay. Um, oh, Christian, quick yeah. on that. Um, Joan Roman is in charge of changing the ADU to 5.10 already. She's She does have that note. Oh, good, okay. Um, so then if, if once you do that, this would be switching over. So this is the checklist you would see that you would download and then you could play with it. Um, so it includes the different sheets for the way we have it organized on five pages. It tells them what documents they need to prepare um, to have for us. That the, we had, uh, Adam had recommended some comments to add that we had added before. Um, just telling, giving people some extra guidance on where to find the information. Um, so we have that in here. And then these are the different pages right now the, that appear on our on the online so the first it's a special permit criteria um so i know pat and i had gone back and forth a little bit the last time we talked about this about whether and how much extra ex explanatory information we should provide for people who are applying um to sort of discuss that um and then we sort of get into the all of you know the dimensional information we ask um, I'm trying to come up with a way to address the question of the different setbacks, depending on the different yard types we have. Um, and I, I haven't had a chance to talk to, to carry about it, um, in inspectional services, but I think there's a way that you can, we can set it up. So if we have a checkbox, so if you check that it's a regular lot, it'll ask for a front rear and two sides. If you ask for a corner, it'll ask for two fronts rear and side. I think there's a way to do that. Um, 
but I need to check in and see exactly how that would work. Um, but this is sort of interesting. This is sort of the first place where sort of Cambridge is deviated. And I'm kind of curious what people think. So what they do is rather we have five, four or five pages of stuff that you fill in. They have like 12 or 15 pages you fill in, but each page is really short. So they have one that is, you know, just the basic information. Then they'll have a second page that's like the frontage and the width of the site. And then a third page that is the setbacks. So it's asking for the same information, but just in smaller chunks. Um, and I wasn't sure if that it if that would be less daunting to people who are filling it out. Um, and if it would make it so that it's easier for them to sort of store their progress and come back to it before they finally submit it or um I, I kind of feel like the our list is pretty long and that may be partly leading to why a lot of people are sort of not filling it out appropriately and are just sort of throwing numbers in to make it go away mr chairman yes mr hanlon so one one of the thing one of the things that it happens when you have less on a page is that you can have more of a theme mm -hmm. for what it is on the page that jumped out at me when you mentioned the lot size and the frontage because the two are related and when you have just a whole long thing in going down so that there's lots of disparate things it it begins to get exhausting, and once you get tired, it get kind of gets to be it gets to be uh, confusing. So that it would be plausible to me, I, and I don't have the experience to know what I really actually think, but it would be plausible to me that if people had more smaller cards, and there was a logical relationship between the things they had, so that they could be focused on one thing with each card, that that might make it easier for people to be patient as they go through the whole thing. Okay. It's like I'm parking. This feels like the amount of stuff that would fit easily on a page without scrolling and um, comes through fairly quickly. But like the that first section, yeah, just it's sort of we're covering like three or four different topics. So it might might be better to better differentiate that by topic. Um, and I know that like this format for the gross floor area, this comes from the old paper form, but I don't know if it's the most helpful way to present it. It might make more sense to do a page of existing and then a separate page of proposed. Like that would be clearer. Um, between the open space calculations, open space still seems to be something that people routinely get wrong. Um, we're working with the one of the applicants for an upcoming hearing to to try to get them to calculate it the right way. Um. Mr. Chairman, the first sentence in the open space is Arlington has specific definitions for these things. Yeah. And I sort of figure that the reason we say specific is that we're being a little bit polite here. Mm -hmm. But what we really mean is that if you think your experience with life in other towns will tell you what's in the Arlington's bylaw, we've got you've got another thing coming. Yeah. So you better look at this because otherwise you'll screw it up and have to spend an extra week getting it right. <laughs> and so maybe specific is too not specific a word, mm -hmm. and we ought to be clearer to say Arlington's by Arlington's bylaw is different from many others you may have looked at. Yeah. And it is important for you to make sure that that you are complying with Arlington's requirements. I mean, something that isn't 
that isn't pussyfoot, pussyfooting around it and, and yeah. threatening that people will have a consequence if if they get it wrong. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I I would just go back and say that I'm all in favor of having this set up, not with regard to the number of pages, but in bite-sized chunks. So as you were sort of going through that, I, I do like that idea much better. Because okay. I do like the idea of being able to review it that way, because I feel that the same sort of exhaustion that can set in if you're filling it out also sets in when I'm reading it. Um, oh, and and so, so I do the idea of that i also think you know just sort of psychologically and maybe this point's been made it's easier if you say oh okay well i'm going to look at open space or i'm going to look at you know lot size or whatever it is and you say okay well i got that part done i'm going to put it down for a minute i just think it's not a bad idea to be able to have people feel like they are making headway and they don't lose their place so mm -hmm. but the other thing as pat was just making the comment about this I mean, there are two different sort of audiences, I think, that these instructions are actually um, aimed at, right? There are the people who are actually the owners of the property, mm -hmm. and then there are the people who are the professionals, whether the architects or the engineers or the, you know, or all of that. And, and I feel like, you know, it is important for us to say to builders and to surveyors and stuff, it's like, we don't care what they do in Bedford. <laughs> which is the last point. And, you know, you better pay attention to our stuff. But I don't think like for open space information, I mean, I still have to read it and go through it and look at it. And I can't imagine somebody who is a, um, you know, a homeowner who is putting a, uh, you know, putting a, uh, you know, a, a um, what the hell am I thinking for? You know, in addition to the third floor from some sort of, you know, bedroom space or something like that. I, th I don't know that they have any clue as to what open space is. And even if they read it, I don't know that they really understand what it is that they're being asked to say. So yep. it necessitates that they have professionals, right, who are going to step in and give this information. So I do think we need tough love when it comes to the pro professionals. Yeah. And I, I my, uh, my partner... Um does a lot of hearings up in Marblehead and they are a much more stringent board up there. I mean, it's that to the point essentially that no one comes before them who doesn't have legal representation. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just the expectation is that you will have, you know, before you even apply, you will have, you know, your documentation is from a registered architect. You'll have a registered land surveyor who has, a, you know, the, 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 um, the survey is from within the previous six months and a couple of other things like that. So they're, you know, I, I think we try to be a little friendlier than that, a little less stringent than that. But I think sometimes it does come back to bite us a little bit that we do end up getting information that's incomplete or not, um, not well vetted. And then I did want to try to start putting in some stuff about the residential design guidelines. I know Pat has been capturing uh, what residential neighborhood in the decisions. Um, we haven't been pushing the neighborhood block category too much yet. Um, that's another feature in there of trying to sort of figure out, you know, is it a small site, single family, medium site, single family? Um, I think there's like six or seven different categories that they use. Um, to be good to capture, but it, I'm a little bit torn as to whether or not this is something that the architects and the residents could figure out, or if it's something that we should be asking, you know, somebody from either somebody from the board or somebody from planning to be deciding what cat what the block category is. I think this sort of goes into a larger discussion about how we use the, the guidelines and that's something we um, may or may not want to get into. 
Mr. Chairman, I wonder if you could refresh our recollections of what what's done in the actual report when they talk about block categories. I've forgotten and mm -hmm. won't find it soon. Yeah. So it it has a little bit to sort of type. It's a little bit of sort of the topography. So, um, like houses in the R zero tend to be single family, large lot which are, you know, that the house is set back from the road, that there's a lot of land around the house. Um, sort of things along those lines, whereas once you get down to single family, uh, small lot, it tends to be things like side driveway or, or parking under. Um, sometimes we'll have a rear yard garage, uh, two family, the typical topography is the two-family house with the direct with the driveway on the side, leading to a garage. Um, and there's a few other sort of things that they basically just sort of try to subdivide a little bit in terms of they really come down to density more than anything else, um, and it sort of leads into some questions about how. The pat the residential pattern on the street works that the some of them are very much driven to you know it's house driveway house driveway house driveway some are a little more like the driveways are consolidated on one side and the houses the open space on the other so that there's a few different things that it does um, but it's also possible that for the way that the guidelines are being used today it's not a helpful distinction and there might well, be other some, things more helpful in some ways it ought to be a helpful distinction there are two reasons why it is that it's useful one is that we don't have that we don't have a very clear mandate for using these things right they were they were not actually originally developed for us to be able to use them in a special permit situation like that that there was migration that that led that to, from being originally something the planning division was going to do uh, to something that that we and the ARB would do. Um, and, but, so what we've been doing is treating this as a character of the neighborhood question. Mm -hmm. And the the mechanism in the guidelines that links up what they say, not just in generally what people in Arlington like to see, but links them up to specific kinds of neighborhoods and the qualities of those neighborhoods is the block category. Mm -hmm. And so th th if we used them more, we'd actually have something that was more nearly tied in with one of the special permit criteria that we're supposed to be applying. And so that would that would be helpful if we could if we could perfect how it is that we would do it and if we were able to do it in a way that would that wouldn't completely perplex the people who are appearing before us mm -hmm. um so it would be cool but one of the things that i was thinking earlier about this was that you know when when we do this it's almost always the placement of the windows yeah uh and and the interest of things on the street and when we want to sort of when, when in the old days, when we had planning department memoranda, when they wanted just to sort of tell us it was all good, they'd say, well, it gives you diversity in the thing and it, it does certain things with the street rhythm and so forth. And, um, and you know, no matter what it is, you can say pretty much the same thing about it. It's very subjective. And so what that means that we, what I always got from that is, okay, the department is giving this one a pass. Um, and then, you get hung up, you get hung up on things that have to do with the facade and so forth. And, you know, it, it seems, it has always seemed to me a little bit too mechanical the way we do it. And it would be great if we could figure out ways of doing it that we, that we get into more of a conversation about what to do. Having just written the Janet Road opinion, mm -hmm. um, I'm quite aware that that can go too far real fast. Um, and at least for those of us who have to summarize it later, but it was a useful discussion in a way that our discussions about the guidelines are not as are not usually that useful. And and so I thought it was it was at least a foray in the right direction and and was impressed when I reviewed the tape. It isn't a tape anymore, but you, you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. 
Mr. Chair, if I could, if I could add to that. Um, I, I think the example that Pat just gave is exactly what I was thinking of when we were talking about this, because they, uh, you know, we were sort of asking some questions about uh, the, the garage and the, the orientation of that facade above the garage. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the responses was, well, that's not a zoning issue. So it is, uh, it is, uh, I think, like Pat said, however, we can make it clear that this is uh, part of the consideration process so that people uh, realize before they get to the hearing that uh, we may ask about, you know, orientation of the facade or windows or something like that. Uh, th I think that's that's really helpful. So I think, you know, I, I, I'm an advocate of keeping this stuff in here uh, and making it clear that they should at least maybe browse through the residential design guideline and find what category they are so they have some familiarity with it. Yeah. Thank you. So a little curious with the, so the other architects on the, on the board, have you had to file electro any electronic applications? And if such, what if, what have you encountered and what sticks out in your mind? I have actually not had to do any zoning submissions as a professional. Yeah. Okay. I've been pretty lucky, I think. <laughs> a lot of our clients don't want to go through the process, so. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. I do them often, Christian, and, um, you know, for the most part, they're bigger projects and, you know, we have our attorney, the, the, the project's attorney, uh, fill out all the paperwork. So, uh, even though I'll develop the presentation, uh, because they're representing bigger projects, there usually, uh, is a real estate attorney involved. Um, but I will tell you that uh, I just did one in Boston, uh, a couple of months ago and there were like you know 40 things on the agenda everyone got five minutes and that was it so it was like you filled out the paperwork they flashed it on the screen you explained the issue and they voted and that was off to the races <laughs> no my word <laughs> <laughs> something to aspire to <laughs> But they, they have a whole team of people, you know, organizing that. So it's a right. very different experience. <laughs> well, what do you think? Should, what if, so I guess the question is sort of what, what next steps? And so it sounds like it would be a, a useful exercise to try to break this down into a, into smaller pieces um, and sort of see what that would look like. Um, so I can work on doing that. Um, and I also need to talk to um, um, Dr. Kerry O'Brien about how to make it work. Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I offer one comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think uh, earlier, uh, I don't know if it was Patrick or Roger or whoever, I, or someone suggested, someone talked about, and it might have been yourself, um, about the gathering of information from users. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably going to be really important to you folks and i would figure out if i could a way to very regularly in the future ask applicants to do an exit interview of some sort now i don't mean interview i mean to gather that information in a regular fashion about their reactions to using your systems mm -hmm. um since they're the ones and the ones that don't even know yet that they are going to be using your systems are, are the folks that have the most variety and the most uh, difficulty understanding what to you folks is second nature at this point. 
I think that's where you ought to spend some time gathering information. So I don't know. I, right now, I know that right now, Colleen is the one that gathers comments and, and uh, input and, uh, you know, brickbacks and, and bouquets, I'm sure. Uh, it's probably not a fun fun seat to sit in when they're not happy with the, the requirements of our systems. But I think that'll help you make it more user friendly and useful in the future, as well as uh, maybe streamline. Just my two cents. No, thank you for that. Um, I know that if, when we get the, we do get the information on who filled out the application. Um, so I could just try reaching out to a few of those people and see if they would be willing to talk to us about um, what their experience was in terms of applying um, and whether you know there are things that we could uh, could do to try to make that a little more easier for them to to handle. Well, I, I, I Mr. Chair, I was thinking um, to make it systematic and a regular expectation of applicants in the future. Ah, okay. You know, more than more than I mean, certainly work with your recent folks that have used the system that you're now trying to improve. But I'm thinking as an ongoing process, it might be better to gather this information on a regular basis by asking for it rather than being dependent on folks uh, having a reaction to it. You know, just, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how you do it. And it may even be uh, a too big an ask for Colleen to do it because it may create a daily user information that may not be that useful. I'm just thinking that if you systematically gather the info, you'll yeah. always be able to constantly do improvements. That's all. Okay. No, thank you for that. All right. So is there any any other feedback from the board in terms of how we may want to structure the the online permitting? Mr. Chair? Yeah, Colleen. Um, my experience overall is that most people want us to do the work for them. They fill in what they want. They send me lots of messages asking me if I can fix things for them, if I can check their numbers. Um, some of them do that before they even fill out the application. I had one lawyer today ask me if he could um, just send me the documents and have um, me fill out the form. Uh, I told him no. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think then when they fill out the form and they don't do a great job, um, yeah. us asking is kind of, asking them to fill out more information, um, kind of like the response that we got today from that one gentleman was like, I didn't, I didn't think we needed that, so I wasn't gonna give it to you. Right. You know, there's, it's a lot of, um, and we have a lot of administrative assistants that fill these out for companies and lawyers. Okay. Yeah, it's tough sort of getting people to take it seriously. This is sort of the same same thing we were struggling with before with, you know, people will, the, the quality of the site plans we get, where some of them are mortgage plans that have a big stamp and then on the corner that says not to be used for any other purpose. And people are submitting them to us. And it's like, uh, no, you can't do that. Um, especially because all this stuff has to be taken over to the registry of deeds and entered into their system. So it's, how do we, I mean, they, the, the one way to make it more difficult to make sure we get the better quality of, of information is you just make it harder to apply. You know, if it's not stretch out the pot, stretch it out so that make sure that, you know, so there's time to review everything before it's finally submitted um, and have them go through it three or four times before we accept it to make sure that they have done everything. Um, is one way to go about it. Um, but it's not the, you know, it's not necessarily the, the, the friendliest way, but the way that we're, the way that we go, where we, you know, we try to be as helpful as, as possible, you know, as, as Colleen says, people try to take advantage of that system and do as little as they possibly can. Something we'll have to think about too. 
Mr. Chairman? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that has always struck me is that, I mean, the, is that the within the limits that this law gives us, which are fairly, which are stringent enough, but they're not so very stringent, we've got the ability to string people out if they're not being cooperative. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people are basically saying, this is a ridiculous it's ridiculous I should have to go through this. It's ridiculous I should have to pay money for a surveyor. It's ridiculous I should have to do any of that. And I'm going to do as little as possible. And I only want to give you what's useful for my case. And it's up to me to decide what's useful in my case. And I'm going to give you that. You can fuss with me. I'll give you something else if you say I really need it. But but we're going to make this a negotiation from beginning to end. Yeah. And if you just say, look, you want a hearing... You want to get this project done this year instead of next year or before the winter comes, yeah. then you better get your act together because we're not going to schedule your hearing until we're satisfied with the record that you've given us. And then do it. Yeah. You know, have people complain to uh, your Arlington and, we, and then have somebody on this board who's really a hard ass saying, yes, and we're going to do it to everybody too, because otherwise they slow the whole system down and it's bad for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I guess a, a question for, for Colleen: How much bandwidth is there really to review the applicant? Like, do do people go through their applications with the building inspector before they file it, or do people just sort of wing it and turn it in? 50 50. Um, if they have been rejected by the building inspector, then they kind of follow, um, you know, they get sent to me and I give them the list of all the stuff they need to do. Okay. Other people, like the gentleman that wanted me to fill out his form today, um, he's just choosing to do a special permit because he knows he needs one and he never had it rejected by the building department first. Mm, okay. Okay. Because I know there are definitely some towns where you cannot apply for a special permit or a variance without a letter of denial from the building inspector, um, which obviously adds a lot of work to the building inspector, um, but does at least provide a little bit better guidance on what exactly they need to get from the board um, rather than you know, applicants sort of guessing before they come to us. I think the issue with that is that they have up to 30 days to approve or deny um, an application. And they mm -hmm. don't want 30 days before they then start the special permit process. Ah. And it could only be two weeks. It's not always guaranteed 30 days, but we do have 30 days from an application start date. Right. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, because I, I think inspectoral services is still down an inspector. Um, so I hate to put more work on the on the department if we don't have to, but. And the inspector they're going to get is only 16 hours. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll have to think about this a little bit. That makes sense. Is there anything else on this topic that people want to add? Yeah, Christian, just maybe to add um, one thing to that is, yeah. you know, uh, in in towns where, uh, or most of the cities where you do have, you do need that denial letter mm -hmm. to get on the docket for a ZPA, um, at least from my experience from, you know, from work, um, when when they deny it, uh, they deny it with the specific areas of zoning relief that are required. 
And I, you know, we still do sometimes have cases where someone's applying for uh, a special permit when they need a variance or a variance when they, you know, like where uh, the relief isn't all, all, all the way defined because they're not exactly sure what the pathway to get uh, a building permit is. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I know you, you just mentioned the limitations of um, having that first review, but that would be one way of maybe making it more clear about what specifically people would need to be asking for from this board. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Chair? Yeah. I do have one question. Um, do we have guidelines on or dates and deadlines when um, applicants are supposed to be submitting documents by? So I, I feel like, especially on continued hearings, sometimes we get documents kind of the last minute and yep. it's can be a challenge to review them in time. Um, you know, depending on when I have time to sit down and look at, you know, a case and then sometimes the documents get added after the fact and I don't always have time to look at them. Right. So Colleen did just run by me a list for next year of potential meeting dates and the dates that things would have to be filed by for those dates. Um, so that's something we could make public. Mr. Yeah. When someone owes me a document because they're changing it, I ask them to give it to me by the Wednesday before the meeting. So it should be in a week, a whole week ahead of time. It doesn't always happen that way. And sometimes they come on Friday morning when I'm not in. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Hey, Christian, one of the things that we, as I recall, one of the things that's in the draft rules that we're working with yeah. Is 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 guidance on that. I think what we had take they had the idea that it had to be in the Thursday before the meeting, but but we did try to address in the rules um that there's a deadline. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if if basically if if we don't enforce it, yeah, I mean th then it then nobody will do it because uh, it's too easy to miss a deadline that nobody's enforcing. But if we just made it a practice and and the word got around that if 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 you filed your document on Friday morning or yep. not in compliance, unless there was a good reason for it and we gave you an exception, it automatically meant a continuance to the next hearing. Right. You're just off the docket. We're going to continue. And, you know, people people would that would matter to them if they did that. Right. And I think I'd just like to add, I, I agree with that. And I think I think the conversation was sort of going around before of um, about miss wrong information on applications. And I think if you start to enforce it in that way as well, um, that it's the hoping the word gets around that, hey, you need to make sure all your ducks in a row for your yeah. meeting otherwise. You know, I think what you're alluding to in, in the guidelines that you that we were looking at earlier, if you know, it can lead to delays. Um, maybe a little bit more direct way of saying it of like, you know, if there's wrong information here, you know, your hearing will get continued or something. Right. Okay. Well, it'd be good to sort of work this into the discussion and the the drafting and the rev revision to the rules and regs, because I think that will, you know, being able to have it in writing and be able to, you know, point people at it and say, no, this is, this is what you're supposed to do. Um, will be more helpful and give us a little bit, something to, to bat, to lean it back against. All right. Well, if anything else comes to mind, feel free to email me anytime. And that means you, Dan, anytime. Yep. Yep. <laughs> no, you don't have to be a resident to email. Me. <laughs> Every other Tuesday, Christian. <laughs> <laughs>
So I was reviewing the dates uh, for our meetings coming up through the end of the year. Um, our second meeting in December would be December 24th. I'm going to recommend that we not meet on that evening if that's acceptable to the board. Mm. Um, so blocking out that date, the next we have October 22nd. Uh, November 12th, November 26th. The 26th is two days before Thanksgiving, but usually that's um, that's fairly light where we can work uh, try to work around that date. And then December 10th would be sort of the last regular meeting of the year. Um, and then we'll pick up again in January. Um, and then I think I don't know if everyone has seen, there's two items on the agenda for next time. Um, a uh, residential project on Ariel Street that we're working with the applicant to clean up the application before they come before us. And then there's a, a 20 pond lane, which I have to schedule a meeting with legal about um, to sort of figure out exactly what it is. It's, in, it's a house that has an existing uh, commercial garage as a part of the residential property in a residential district. And they're trying to get a special permit to extend the use. Um, so trying to figure out exactly what what it is they have and what they're asking for. So um, I try to meet with uh, with legal next week on that. Get a little more background with that. Unless there's anything else this evening, I would like to thank you all for your participation. It's nice meeting with the <laughs> Zoning Board of Appeals. And I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially I'd like to thank Colleen Ralston for all her assistance in preparing for and hosting our online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording. The meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. And it's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Thanks, Mr. DuPont. So vote to adjourn for the evening. Uh, voting yes or no, Mr. DuPont? Yes. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Holly? Yes. Mr. Brigadelli? Yes. Ms. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so much for coming out this evening. And we will see Thank you all in a weeks. Okay. Take care. Take care, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. Have a great vacation, Colleen. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.